Well, hey, if you have a Bible, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and uh, we have been in this letter for some time now. And, and uh, Paul has been answering a lot of questions about um, a, a lot of things that, have been, um, that, that the Corinthians have been asking, but uh, not only answering their questions, but he has been providing answers for things that they don't have questions about, but just, uh, just some issues that have, been, that have been going on in the church. And so Paul is um, coming alongside. He planted this church. He knows these people. He loves these people. Uh, he wants to see them flourish. He wants to see them in their relationship with God to grow. And, and, uh, and so um, he writes, he's pretty direct. And, and in the last, in, actually in the last uh, several weeks, we've seen that he's answered a lot of questions concerning um, marriage and singleness and divorce and these kinds of things. And, but in chapter eight, he shifts gears and he's answering um, a different kind of question. And so here's what he says in verse one, chapter eight, says, now concerning food offered to idols. Now, you and I, we have a lot of questions about faith, all right? We have a lot of questions when it comes to um, following Jesus, and we've got, we've got questions that are around suffering, questions about doubt, questions about what happens after this life, like heaven and hell. Um, can I trust the Bible? Um, but what we do, what do I do about food that has been offered to idols? I'm assuming it's probably not in your top three today, right? Um, I'm assuming that not a lot of us have been struggling this week with going... But what do we do about that food that was offered to idols? Um, we, this is just not something that we're really, really wrestling with. But I will say this. This is, this is something that they were really wrestling with in, in, in that day in, in Corinth, in the Corinthian church. This was a major issue. And not only that, even today, even today around, around the world, I know we can kind of get kind of laser focused because we just live, we just know what we know, right? We just do what we do. We know America, we know what we you know, know here, but we can kind of get kind of focused in on like we're, like, we're about like, is, is there anybody else in the world? And, but the truth of the matter is there are others in this world right now that deal with this, that this is a question that they have. What do we do about, about food that has been offered to idols, and uh, and this this was a big deal. So, so Corinth was a was a big city in the Roman Empire. It was a big city with a polytheistic society, which just means that they worshipped and believed um, in the in the presence of many gods. And uh, and so all over the city there were there were there were all of these temples there were all of these idols um, that they were they would go into and these the temples were seen as intersections between uh, heaven and earth and so they would go into the temples to try to appease the gods and so um, they just kind of mo most of the gods that they worshipped they, they were gods that they just deemed as angry um, they were angry gods that they needed to just um, they, if they wanted something they needed to go and appease that God first. And so the way to appease the God is to bring a sacrifice. Um, and so they would bring the sacrifice. So if you needed, um, say you're a farmer and you needed rain for your crops, you would go into the temple of Poseidon, the God of rain and the God or the God of water. And then you would offer sacrifice to Poseidon. If you needed, um, if you were looking for a husband, you really wanted a husband and you would go to the temple of Ap um, Epaphrodite and you would, uh, the goddess of love and make a sacrifice. And maybe, maybe she will look kindly upon you and and give you a husband. And typically the way sacrifices worked is you would bring an animal into the, into the temple. And, 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 the, and an animal in that day was, I mean, it cost, uh, cost you greatly. It was expensive. And, but you would bring this animal into the temple and you would make this sacrifice. But you didn't, it was not required to leave uh, the entire animal there at the sacrifice. You could take it, you would leave a third of the animal for the sacrifice for that God. And then you would take a third of it to the meat market and sell it. And then you take the other third of the animal and you would invite your family and friends into the temple where you made the sacrifice and you would feast on the on this meat, on this food, and uh, and this and this was just normal life. This is just the way. Uh, this just just the way that it went uh, in 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 Corinth. It was just going from temple to temple. This is just what everybody did. He's like, what do, what do you need? Well, I'm I'm really looking for some. I, I need some help with my crops. And so you're, you see a line at the at this temple, and there would be a line over here at this. And they were. This was just normal way of living in Corinth. And then Paul shows up, and he brings the message that there is one God, and this one God has sent His Son to us. He sent Jesus 
Jesus to us, and he has made the once and for all sacrifice for our sin. So there's no other sacrifice to be made, and there's one, only one God um, that, 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 it, that exists over and above all. And so the people hear this message, many people hear the message of Paul, and they believe Paul. They believe him, and they leave their, their, their ways of worshiping all of these other idols and all these other gods and go to worship God and God alone. And they, and they find themselves in this church that Paul had started, and uh, which is these are the people that Paul is writing this letter to. And, but here's what's happening. Some of these Christians, though, some of these Corinthian Christians were being invited by family and friends that had made sacrifices in these temples and they were being invited into the temple to have this feast. And to them, it was going, they're going, look, we know that there is only one God, that we know that these idols mean nothing. We know that, that you know, these, these feasts and all that, it, there's nothing to that. And, and by the way, these, these feasts that they would have, they thought these feasts were like there was something spiritual to this. There was something about when you ate the food that the, that the spirit of the God that you just made sacrifice to would enter into your body. And so it was a spiritual kind of moment. So, but, so then you have these Christians, these Corinthian Christians, some of them are being invited into this, this feast. And these Corinthian Christians are going, it's nothing. Like, I mean, it's just food. We're, we can go eat the food. It's no big deal. I mean, there is no, this, this doesn't mean anything. The idols, they don't mean anything. This food, there is no spirit that is going to come. Like, it means nothing. And so they would go in, and they're just looking at us. They bring their family. They're like, look, we get a nice meal on somebody else's dime. This is great. Well, some other others in the church, in the Corinthian church, were looking at their brothers and sisters, their other Christians, walking into these temples, and they just can't figure it out. They're, they're having a hard time. It's tripping them up. They're, they're, they're confused. It's messing with their faith. So what was happening is essentially there were two sides, as we have seen in, in Corinthians. There has been, there are two sides. There's, there's, it's a divided church. There's two sides in, in, a lot of, in a lot of things. But there are two sides when it came to this. It was, and they were on completely opposite ends of the spectrum. And one side was the side of legalism. Now, the side of legalism is essentially this. It, it is, and they would never say this out loud, and essentially this is where, I mean, this is not, this is not die in Corinth. This is, this is among us today. And legalism says this. Legalism says, well, 90% of my salvation is dependent upon Jesus' life, death, and resurrection in my place for my sin. He accomplished it. But the other 10%, I got to top it off with my own morality and living a cleaned up life. It's through your cleaned up life. It's, it's the fact that you know, you've never cussed out loud, the fact that you've never drank that, you've never, you've never smoked that, like, that you just live this moral, you know, cleaned up life that God looks at that along with the death of Jesus and says, I am pleased with you. This is, this is, this is legalism. And here's what tends to happen. Um, those in the camp of elite, of legalism, then they take all of these things. It's this morality that they've accomplished and that they're living in, and they look at other people and they go, "And you should live the same way that I live." And they take all the things that are that they add on to live, following Jesus that they've determined that this is the way I this is the way a Christian should live. This is the way a follower of Jesus should live. And they look at others and go, "You should be living like this," and they and they will judge you by it. So here's what happens because this is a, this is certainly alive and well today that many of you grew up in a home like this. And you grew up and it was all about the rules and it was all about like this is morality and, and all this. And it was maybe a little bit of Jesus, but mainly it was just, just, just behave. Just act like this. We don't do this. We do this. We live like this. You know? and, and when you got older, you, just, you decided, I ain't going to do that. I don't want that. And so you went to the other end of, of the spectrum. You went to license. Because you read the Bible and you saw where Jesus went to parties. And you saw where Jesus drank wine. And you're going, well, Jesus drank wine. Jesus went to parties. I got freedom, baby. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do parties. I'm going to do the wine. And so this is what you did. You just went all the way over here. And it, although when you read Jesus, when he went to the parties and, and did all that, like every time Jesus went to a party, somebody, was, give, somebody was, was repenting and putting their faith and trust in Jesus and becoming a follower of Jesus, even though you may not have shared the gospel with anybody for a decade. That's another sermon for another day. But so anyways, there, so, but, but it could have been that you went the other way. Maybe you went the other way. You grew up in a home where it was so 
crazy. It was so messed up. It was so like, like mom and dad were like, hey, just, you know, just, you know, make sure you're protected and, you know, don't hurt anybody and just live your life, man. Just do what you want to do. And, that, and you just kind of lived and there was really no parameters. There was no like parent, like parental involvement. It was just, you just live, just do what you want to do. And perhaps you grew up and you're going, you know what? Um, and maybe you become a follower of Jesus and you're going, man, my, my, my childhood was so messed up. It was so crazy. I don't want anything to do with that. And my parents just let me go and I got involved in all kinds of stuff and I don't want that for my family. And so what you did as becoming a follower of Jesus, you put up all these barriers, you put up all these rules, all these boundaries, and you kind of put yourself over here in the category of the legalist. But this is what we tend to do. We go from one end to the other. But here's the thing about Christianity, the thing about Christianity that makes a lot of people nervous, especially those that live over here in legalism is that while there are a lot of things in, about Christianity in the Bible that are black and white, things that are very clear about in the way, life, like the way that God created life to go, there's much to be said uh, that in the scripture about, hey, this is how life goes. This is how you live your life. And we've gone over some of these in, in, the, in the last few weeks, that, that marriage is between a man and a woman for life. It's a covenant for life. That, that sex is for marriage, that sex before marriage is sin, that, that murder is sin, it is wrong, that, that, that Jesus has done the work for our salvation. He is God's son come to us. He lived and died and rose in our place for our sin. And the only way to salvation is through Jesus. This is black and white. This is in the scripture. The Bible, it is inspired. It is, it is without error. It is God's word. It is the authority for our life and for our good. These are the things that we don't, there's no gray area about that. This is what the Bible says. But then there are other things that the Bible isn't so black and white about, that these are the gray area, areas. And listen, and you have to be very, very careful to not take what the Bible is not black and white about and make it a black and white issue and project that on other people. Some people, so in this, with the media context here, Paul is getting at some people can eat meat and it doesn't violate their conscience. And some people cannot eat meat. And both can be okay. And listen, before we get into this, understand Paul's position here. Paul would totally say, you have freedom to eat meat. You have freedom to eat the food that was offered to idols. You have that freedom. Yes, in Christ, we are free. That would totally, is totally where Paul say. I mean, you read Galatians. Galatians, you would see that this is, this, he is going, look, we're free from the law. Stop trying to live up to the law. We are free from the law. So he would totally put himself in the category of, hey, you are free to eat the meat. And he could have just said that. He could have just said, hey, listen, we're free in Christ. Y'all just need to just get with it. Let's, it's fine. Let's leave them alone. They can go eat in the temple. It's no big deal. That's not what he says, though. Even though that's where he stands. Like, that's where he, under, like, that's his understanding. That's not, where, that's not what he says. Here's what he says instead. Now, concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge, and this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Paul's going, before we ever get into an answer here of what, who's right and who's wrong and what we should be doing with this food offered to idols, let me remind you of the point of knowledge. L let me remind you of why, like what knowledge leads to, is meant to lead us to, and that is to love. It's always to love. But if you're not careful, you'll, you'll turn knowledge that you've received and you'll turn it inward and it will puff you up. It will make you arrogant. It will begin to shape the way that you view others who don't see life the way you see life. But love has to be the goal here. That love has to be the goal. Whether you agree or you don't agree, it has to be. At the end of the day, it has to be. Love has to be. It doesn't matter how, how right you are. Love has to be the goal, even if you know you're right. See, because here's the thing. Some of you, some of you in this room, some of you, you just, you just know. You, you know this. Like, you know it. You know that there's nothing wrong with your children going out to trick-or-treat. You know that. 
Like, you know, that's not a problem whatsoever. Like, you know, there's no problem with that. That is totally okay. And you know, you know that at the end of the night, at the end of the night, your kid's not going to end the night by, by, you know, making a sacrifice to demons. And you know that. Like, you feel like freedom in that. Like, that's, it's okay. And yet, how do you interact with those who are convinced that it's a real problem? Do you just write them off as weirdos? Or do you understand that love builds up and knowledge destroys? Some of you, you know, you just, you know, you know that Donald Trump is the best thing that ever happened to this country. Now, you know it. Like, I mean, you just know it. And you, and you tell everybody about it, don't you? Like, you know, it. Donald Trump, he's the best. He's the best thing that ever happened to this, to this country. And yet some of you, you know, you know that Donald Trump is the worst thing that ever happened to this country. You know it. You just, you just know it. I mean, just read it. I mean, just come on. And you tell everybody about it. But how do you interact with those who don't see it the way you see it? Do you get angry? Or do you know that love builds up? This is what Paul is getting at. Paul has an answer to the question. He's got an answer to the question, for sure. But the answer isn't what matters. Because sometimes being right is not the point. And so he says, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. What Paul is saying, if you think you know, and yet you don't know how to love someone who doesn't, think that, who doesn't see it the way you see it, then you don't know what you ought to know. You don't know. So, so here's, here's the knowledge that Paul, that, 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 that some of the Corinthians are operating from. And, and it's the knowledge that Paul has. Paul, and it's the knowledge that's going, yeah, we get this. Like, yeah, I'm with you in this. And so Paul's just going to spell that out. Here's, here's, here's what he's going to say. And, and when he says it, I mean, those that are asking the question, those that are going into the temples, like taking their family for a, for a meal, they're going, yes, that's what I'm talking about. Like, that's it. That's like, yes, Paul, that's, that's what it is. So here's what he says. He's just, he's, just going to say, he's just going to spell it out for them. He says, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no, re no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. Now, so what is, real quick, what is Paul saying here? Because it seems as though Paul just said, there are no, no other gods but God. But then he just said, but actually there are indeed many gods and many lords. So what, what is going on here? So all the way back in Exodus, when God is bringing the people, his people out of Egypt, you remember how he, did, he does this, he, how he brings these people out. He goes to, he uses Moses and says, Moses, go to, go to Pharaoh. And so Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, Pharaoh, listen, the God of all these people that you've enslaved, he has sent me to you to tell you to let these people go. And if you don't let them go, God's going to send a plague. So I'm warning you now, let them go. And he goes in 10 times. Ten times, and each time, each time, Pharaoh, sometimes he says yes, and then he says no, but, but at, at the end of the day, it's like it, Pharaoh says, I'm not letting him go. So every time, God sends a plague to the nation of Egypt. And he, every time that Pharaoh refuses, he sends a plague. And before God sends the tenth plague, he tells Moses what's coming. God lets Moses in on what's coming. Find this in Exodus 12. He says this, God tells Moses this, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. So God sent plagues. He turned the Nile River into blood. He sent a plague of frogs and flies and, and disease to the, to, to the animals. And, and, and darkness covered the land. He sent all of these plagues. And each plague, understand that each plague was not just a... a just a random act of just trying to annoy Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. That's not what was going on. But each, each, each plague that God sent was aimed at a specific God that the Egyptians worshipped. So they worshipped the God of the sun. And God says, I'll shut the sun off. 
God, they worship the God, the God of the Nile, and God turns the Nile into blood. They worship, the, they worship gods whose images bore the head of a, of a frog and, and another one of the head of a fly. And God's going, you like frogs? I'll send you frogs. You like flies? I'll send you flies. This was God's way of saying, look, I am over all gods. Whatever power they might have, I have power over them. I can shut them all down. After Israel escaped Egypt, God gave them the Ten Commandments. And so they're there in the wilderness after coming out of Egypt. And, and God gives them the Ten Commandments Then say, hey, this is how I created your life to go. And he says this in Exodus 20. He says, I am the Lord, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I am the Lord your God. Because there are many gods, and God is the creator of everything. He is before everything, and he, is, he comes after everything. And then Moses, right before, before, the, uh, before Israel goes into the promised land, Moses gathers the people's, people together, and he gives them this statement called the Shema. It's come to know as the Shema. It, this is the statement that the Jews would repeat every single day, multiple times a day. And he gives them this statement. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And basically, he's going, look, we worship one God. We worship one God, the, the one who is over and above all other gods. This is, this, is, this is the definitive statement for all of Israel to say, hey, there is only one God who is above every other God, and he is one. So then it's like, well, then who are these gods? Who, who are these gods then that God's going, look, listen, put me over every other God. Put me, I, I'm, going, I'm going to come down upon the gods of Egypt. Like, what, what does he, like why, why does he acknowledge these gods? Well, throughout the scripture, it speaks of, the scripture speaks of something called powers and dominions and demons and spiritual forces and principalities. That they're all created to worship God. That God created all of these things to worship God. But instead of worshiping God, they rebelled against God and now are at work among, the, among us to lure us away from God and into the worship of other things. And for Christians, now, I mean, for us, I mean, especially in America, like our temptation, the temptation for us is not to go find a temple on our way home and go of another idol or another God and go worship in that temple. Like that, we're not being drawn into like to, to worship the idols of, of Hindu or, or, or what have you. But for sure, there are idols among us. For sure, there are gods among us. For sure, these demons and spiritual forces and principalities and dominions, they are luring us into, to give ourselves to other things to have master over us. And it's more subtle than going into a temple to worship some for an idol. And it's because it's so subtle, I would say it's more dangerous that they lure us into things that have master, us, master over us that, will, that we give ourselves to, that things like food, things like sex, our kids' sports, family, these things have a subtle way of luring us in and all of a sudden have dominion over us that take the place of the one true God. Now, we would never say, well, I've now abandoned God for my kids' baseball team. We would never say that. We're just watching my life. And God calls his people away from these things to worship him alone. So Paul is going, so here's what we know. These idols that these people are worshiping, they mean nothing to worshipers of God who is over all. They mean nothing. So here's what he says in verse 6. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all thing, are all things and through whom we exist. Now, you may not have caught it, but what Paul just did here is brilliant. He's, it's brilliant because Paul takes the Shema, the statement that they all knew, 
and they, he put Jesus right in the middle of it. That there is one God, that he is the one, he is, there is one God, the one who is Lord over all, and he takes Jesus and puts him right in the center of it. God is the creator of everything, and he did it through Jesus Christ. God is the one who redeems us, and he does it through Jesus Christ. So Paul has just said, this is the knowledge that we have. The idols, they are a lame substitute for, 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 our, for our God. God is over all, and eating food that was used to worship idols, it means nothing. Like, it means nothing. It, we are free, and the Corinthians are going, yes, Paul, that's what I'm talking about. That's what we've been trying to say. There are all these people that can't handle us going in, taking our family in for a nice meal. We've been trying to tell them this the whole time. One God, one Lord. These idols have no real power. The meat is just meat. It's not worship. Thank you, Paul, for articulating this in such a wonderful way. Now let's go get some steak. Right? And then Paul says, hold on. Verse 7. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. And this, and this, is, this is Paul saying, I, I, know, I know you have knowledge, but not everyone has your knowledge. Not, every, not everyone has your theology. Not everyone has your politics. So the question is, can you die to your knowledge so someone else can hear about Jesus? Can you die to your politics so someone can hear the gospel? Because if what you put out front in your life is your politics, then you're making it really hard for someone who doesn't see it the way you see it to hear what they really need to hear. Look, everyone is not going to think like you. That we all come from different experiences. We all come from different struggles with certain stuff in our background, in our life. So Paul is going, so are you willing to sacrifice that thing, that freedom, that point of view, that knowledge? Are you willing to lay that down so God is glorified? Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we... Do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Paul's going, look, even, even, even though you're free to eat the food, it's not getting you anywhere with God. Like, even, even if, okay, so you're free to eat it, but it's not doing anything for your relationship with God. Like it's not, it's not like going, like having certain meals is going to be like, this is, in, this is increasing my, 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 you know, my intimacy with the Lord and, and closeness with, with God. Like, and, and, by, and then the same token, by not eating it, it's not, getting, it's not removing something from your relationship with God. And people are not going to be drawn to God because you have license to live like you want to live. And on the flip side, people are not drawn to God if you live like a legalist. But, but listen, this is where we gravitate. This is where we go. We go one or the other. And, and it's always been this way. I mean, go all the way back to the beginning in the garden, with Gen Genesis chapter 2 and 3. God, God creates everything, he, he cre and it's all good. I mean, God says it is good. I mean, it's, he creates this beautiful garden. He puts these two naked people in the garden, says be fruitful, multiply, make the rest of the earth look like this beautiful garden. They have a job to do. It's awesome. Life is great. And he puts this tree in the middle of the garden and says, don't eat of this tree. And life was great. Life was great. And, and, and a lot of people get hung up on this tree. Like, what's, what's up with the tree? In fact, our last... Um, baptism class we did for kids, we had for kids, uh, we had a time at the end where we asked, like, are there any questions? And you always get a little nervous when you ask kids, do you have questions? And, and um, so one kid said, yeah, I got a question. He said, if God did not want them to sin, then why did he put that tree in the middle of the garden and tell them not to eat of it? That's a great question. And here's what we get from that. That even before sin came into the world, God built into us that our greatest joy comes from trusting God. Like, 
obedience came before sin ever showed up. That our greatest joy so it's tied up, it's all, it's all wrapped up in our trusting God and obeying God. So every time that they went to bed that night and did not eat of that tree, they can, they're, they're saying, God can be trusted. I don't know why we can't eat of that tree, but God said it and we trust him. And their joy was all wrapped up in that. Well, what happens? Genesis 3, the serpent comes along and says the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he says to the woman, check this, he says, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Kind of sounds like a legalist, any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the, tree, of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. God didn't say that. Eve, you just made that up. God did, not, God did not say, do not touch the tree. He said, don't eat from the tree. He didn't say, don't touch the tree. This, see, this is the legalist in us. To create rules, to make, to make rules. You, you, this is what we do. You know who does not add rules? You know who do not, cre- like they don't, they don't create rules? Kids. Like I've never had, I've never had one of my kids like, create a rule like kids your bedtime's at nine dad I think maybe eight o'clock would be a better idea you know I never had that never had that they just they've never had a kid like buck up against the rule saying no I think you need to get a little stronger on that I think you need to get a little harder on that never had that never but you know who does that we do we do we do that and you want to know why because we want control we want control if I do this If I create these rules, these boundaries, then God would be more pleased with me. And if God is more pleased with me, then maybe he'll make my life go the way that I want my life to go. And so I'll set up all these rules because to put God, in in a sense, in a corner to make sure my life goes the way that I want my life to go. It's the legalist in us. It's about control. But then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. See, this is the way some of you look at the Bible. You look at the Bible like God is trying to keep something from you. You say, all these things in the Bible that God says, all these things that I'm supposed to, ways that I'm supposed to live my life, he's just trying to keep me from enjoying my life. Like not having sex before marriage. It tells me to be generous with my stuff, like to give my money away, to give my, to be generous and give, give, like share what I have. God's just trying to steal from me any chance of, of happiness and joy in my life. And so you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna live life the way I want to live my life because hey, I'm free. I'm free. And so I'll take the whole, you know, Jesus died on the cross for my sin and I'll get to go to heaven one. I'll take that and now I'll live my life like I want to live my life. And it's the same problem, whether you're a legalist or you're licentious. You you, you do not trust God and you do not trust his word. That to you, God is not good. And God cannot be trusted. But Jesus says, I came so that you might have life. Not just like eternal life. I'm talking about a full life. Abundant life. I came that you might have life abundantly. That the source of our greatest joy is following in the way of Jesus. That we go after other things like money and relationships and status, looking for a full life, looking for an abundant life. And Jesus is going, no, no, no. A full life does not come apart from me. Certain, a full life comes only by way of me. I mean, okay, of course, people who are not followers of Jesus, they have good days, right? They have good days and they, and they can find happiness in life, all coming from God's common grace that we are his image bearers, whether Christian or not. But nobody comes to the abundance, the fullness of life outside of Jesus. Nobody experiences the fullness of life. Nobody comes to the place where obeying Jesus is a delight and not a duty, where joy, there's joy in the suffering. That doesn't happen outside of knowing the creator of all things, the God above all gods. 
And so Paul says, but take care that this right of yours, and it's a right, but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if, he, if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ has died. So these Christians, these weaker Christians, they're, they came out of this, this life of just going from temple to temple and, and being a part of all this. Like, this is what we do. They, they were like the spirits, they will enter into us and we're at these feasts and we offer these, these sacrifices and we do this to appease all the gods. Like, this was their life. And then God saved them out of that and they see that God is the one true God and Jesus is the one true sacrifice and we're wholly devoted to Jesus. And yet, as they're out and about, they're watching some people that they're in a, like they've just met with in a Bible study in their house, or they've just been gathered in a, in a worship service at, on, at, at, the, at the church, and they're watching these people, the people that they know, going into these temples, and they can't figure it out. It's, it's, it's causing them to question what they themselves believe about God. It's not causing them to question, are you really saved? It's causing them to think, maybe there's, I didn't get this. Maybe this isn't what I thought it was. Maybe the God that we, the, that we have been worshiping is just one of the gods. And we just go from place to place and we need to continue to do this. It's, it's, it's destroying their faith. And Paul's going, and that stuff that you're holding on to so tightly because you have knowledge, that you have insight, you have freedom, that, 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 that meal that you're going to, like eating that food, it, this, it means nothing. It doesn't do anything for your relationship with God. It doesn't remove anything from your relationship. It does nothing in terms of your relationship with God. Let me tell you what does matter. Faith. And for all of your freedom, and for all of your knowledge, you are destroying the faith of others, and that is a problem. Not just for them, but for you. He says, thus sinning against your brothers and sisters and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Those on your left and, and those on your right, they are family. And when you sin against them, well, you're sitting against Christ. And so Paul is saying, we, we need to learn to ask different questions than what the world is asking. We, we need to go further in our questions than simply asking the questions. Because listen, we are so programmed, particularly, I can, I can only speak for our culture, but, but in America, we are so programmed to focus on and obsess over the rights and the privileges and the liberties of the individual to where every decision is just about you. It, 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 is, is it, can I, can I do this or can I not? Is it a sin or is it not? That's all I need to know. Is it a sin or is it not? And Paul is saying, we can't just stop with that question. Is it sin for me or is it not? We need to take the question, we need to ask the next question. Okay, so it's not sin for me. But will this cause somebody else to stumble? So it's not sin for me. But is what I am doing or getting ready to do, will it affect somebody else? This is how Christians think. The word Paul uses here for stumbling is the Greek word scandalizo. It's a, he's just saying it, it's a scandal. It's a scandal that causes somebody else to trip and fall. Listen, understand, Paul's not just talking about two groups of people who just get irritated of one another's preferences for eating or drinking. He's talking about causing someone to stumble into worshiping other gods, going back to the old ways of living before they came to know Christ. Paul is saying, for the sake of having a nice meal, you're willing to destroy the faith of a brother or sister. 
So what about us? I mean, I'm assuming not many of us had intentions on heading to a pagan temple after church for a meal out with the family, right? I'm assuming that's not wasn't in our plans. But what does this look like for us? I mean, does this even apply to us? I mean, food offered to idols? Like, where, where do we get that? Like, what is, what is going on? Where's the parallel here? Where's the application for us? Well, I think there are a lot of ways in which we find ourselves in this passage. A lot of ways in which we celebrate our freedom and potentially destroy the faith of our brothers and sisters. I'll just give you some. One. Drinking alcohol in the presence of certain Christian brothers and sisters could cause them to not only fall into old habits, but to abandon Christianity altogether. The way that we spend our money, the language that we use, the games that we play for entertainment, the shows and the movies that we watch, and even the clothes that we wear have the ability to lead others away from Christ. Do I have freedom in these things? You better believe it. But that's not the question. That's not the only question. Have you ever considered, like when you post that picture of your new car, or when you post those pictures of your vacation, or you post that picture of your perfection of a child, God bless you, have you ever considered... Like, what is this, what kind of effect does this have on someone who's looking at this? You ever thought about that? Like, how does this affect somebody else? Have you ever stopped to think about, like, what's the motive behind me even putting this out there? Well, it's not wrong. And it's not sin. But that's not the point. Will it cause someone else to stumble? Will it cause someone else to covet? I just couldn't help but think how interesting it is that Paul's response here is not to tell the weak ones to grow up. I mean, I just feel like that would be very Paul-like. Like, hey, we have freedom here. Grow up. It's okay. Let them eat their meal. It's fine. He doesn't do that. But instead, he tells the informed ones, the ones that seem to be the stronger ones, to grow up. Because this is what I want to do. I I want you to just think like me. If I can just get you to level up to think like, like, think like me, then I don't have to sacrifice anything. Like, I'm I'm good. Like, if I can just get you to see where I'm coming from and, and to agree with me on that, then I don't have to change. That's what I want. But that's not what Paul does. Paul says, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat. Lest I make my brother stumble. See, Paul knows that they were right in their knowledge about the insignificance of idols. But it wasn't about being right. It was about love. It was about making a difference. It was about the faith of others. And ultimately, the glory of God. I don't know where this lands on you, but maybe nothing has come to mind in particular, but would you be willing to lay down your freedom for the sake of someone else? If the thought of laying down some of your freedoms makes you nervous, have you ever thought, why is that? Why am I so bent on, no, it's my freedom. I can do this. It's not sin. Why can't you let that go? And maybe that says more about you than it does about them. In fact, Paul talks about that in chapter 10. He said, we are only truly free if we can set aside our freedom for the sake of someone else. And for the Christian We carry the name and we find our identity in the one who came from heaven and became a servant to us to take on our sins so that we might be free. Or you can say it like this. The most entitled person to have ever lived 
in the history of the world gave up his rights for us. And may we go and do the same for the glory of God and for the love of our brother and sister.